Good morning, everybody. My name is Adriana de Trinidad. I am a field and enrollment representative with the New School of Architecture and Design. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome all of you to our Design in Mind event. Um, and so we have uh, Elena Pacenti with us today. She is a Dean of the School of Design. And um, she is going to be sharing a little bit about uh, the programs that she has um, for the design programs. Let me open this up really quick. Okay. And so right now we're doing just the introduction. This is the map of the day. And then we have the programs overview, which Elena will be presenting. Uh, and then graphic design will be the first program um, that we'll be presenting today. Uh, then we will be taking a short break and then we'll be going into product design, interior architecture and design. And then lastly, we're going to have a Q&A, talk about the admissions process and everything else that might pop up. Uh, and so next up, I'm going to let Elena Pacenti, again, the Dean of the School of Design here at New School, uh, to take it away. Thank you, Adriana, and welcome everyone um, to, to our Design in Mind event. I'll try to quickly give you an overview of the design programs at New School. And um, let me start by sharing my screen and go into my... PowerPoint. We have been living with technologies for a long time uh, now, but still every time we, we, we use technologies, there's always some surprise. So uh, it's part of, uh, of our lives, but here we go. So the School of Design, a new school, um, includes three main uh, programs and disciplines. Uh, the Bachelor of Interior Architecture and Design, the Bachelor of Science of Graphic Design and Interactive Media, and the Bachelor of Product Design. Obviously, and, and on, beside the, the major and the degrees, we also offer minors and, and certificates, and we introduce two concentrations uh, for the fall 2021. Um, the minors is a very important part of the experience because while students are taking uh, a major in one of these disciplines, they can take a minor in one of the other disciplines. By doing so, we hope to provide students with all the possibilities to have a 360 degrees uh, understanding of design. Design uh, professions are evolving rapidly. They evolve every day together with the technologies <laughs> that we use every day. And so it's very important to be very well-rounded to enter the world of design and the profession and to rest and to stay relevant um, in, in the field by understanding what, you know, where, where the, the, the professions themselves are leading to. Uh, why is studying design a new school? Well, we think that, um, some of the main characteristics of what we do at New School are, first of all, a design thinking, a human-centered design, uh, think, thinking. Oh, I think it's his sister. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, which is an underlining approach, very much in line with the industry. So what we consider being the the most innovative approach to design, which is shared among all the design disciplines. And I'll tell you in a few seconds how we run the, the, the first common foundation year together to, to start having this uh, design thinking mindset and the grammar of design all together. We develop uh, real life projects with the faculty of professional practitioners. This is something we are very uh, proud of. Uh, all our faculty members are actually designers and they bring in cl the classrooms their experiences, uh, their direct experiences. So it's a way of learning, uh, not just theoretical, but is very pragmatic. 
We have a group of international faculty and students, which we are also very proud. Um, we think that uh, being uh, aware of uh, uh, diversity in the cultural approaches is an enrichment and it's a value for design. And we have a small class size and a personal relationship with instructor. This is one of the main characteristics of our schools is really being able to be in a, in a group and, uh, and being able to have a direct uh, relationship with your faculty and learn directly from them. Being helped is you're not just one of the many in a classroom, but it's a very one-to-one -one interactive approach. Obviously, studying design is designing. So the way we teach design is through studio or any class lab, lecture lab classes. So developing, developing projects is the way to learn design. Um, let me go through the, through, the, through the programs really quick. Um, I'll start with interior, don't, 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 me, don't mind the sequence. Um, interior architecture and design is a, uh, the, the program that um, has as a mission to nurture innovative and inspired designers able to conceive, plan, and detail, and detail interior environments that support and enhance user experience and harmonious living. One of the main characteristics of our program is uh, to be very integrated with, uh, in a school of architecture, so taking advantage of being in a school of architecture, we learn interior by working also with architecture students and we form designers not just able to take a, take a, a building and, and work inside, but work on the architecture as well in order to be more effective and innovative. We do not, all our design programs are based on a four years full time um, uh, uh, attendance. Uh, based on a quarter system. So we consider full-time three full quarters uh, of attendance a new school. The foundation here, as I mentioned, is, is in common to the three disciplines. The following years are based on obviously the, the different uh, aspect of the discipline. And in the case of interior architecture and design, we have a sequence of studios um, from second year to fourth to go through projects and learning of the disciplines gradually, but always designing. And what we do is to explore very many typ typologies of interiors. As you well know, interior architecture and design is an opportunity to, to work in many different industries, not just residential, it's not just about homes, but mainly is about commercial and, and, and public spaces. So we go through uh, typologies as hospitality, and these are examples of big projects we did for um, for uh, resorts and and together in partnership with some big comp industry companies with like Gensler, um, retail so designing stores and and the brand of the stores together, um, obviously the residential. This is an example of a, of, a, of a project that the interior designers of third year developed together with the, with the architecture students of fourth year. And that's where we, we approach a new building starting from in, in, inside and outside. Uh, but also we approach very difficult typo typologies like healthcare hospitals. And this gives you the breadth of what interior architecture and design can be, working in all these different uh, typologies of places and making a difference. In the fourth year, uh, we let the students choose uh, their typology. These are examples of, uh, of last or final projects where based on adaptive reuse of existing buildings in communities, this is a community center developed for uh, an area, difficult area in Oakland this is a high-end gastronomy center developed in the Irving building here in San Diego as another example. So what do you do after a bachelor in interior architecture and design? Obviously we can, you can specialize as a residential interior designers or a commercial retail 
healthcare, that we have several companies in San Diego specializing in healthcare, exhibit and event design, environmental and sustainable design, becoming an expert on sustainability of buildings or well or lead. And we are introducing a, a, a concentration starting this fall for the third year students and up on sustainable adaptive use, how to make existing building change destination, taking into consideration the well-being of people and the well-being of the building <laughs> and historical preservation. Uh, space planning, software rendering, sometimes getting into the industry with a high knowledge on software lead you to a, a good pathway. And so I hope I am um, going well in time. So the second pro pro uh, program I'm presenting today is product design. Product design, the mission of the program is to nurture innovative and inspire designers who can think and develop system solution to aesthetically function and emotionally improve people's life, lives. Um, product design is a discipline that has changed along the decades to encompass not just traditional objects like everything we use every day and uh, furniture or something that is very tangible and material, but also um, the, um, uh, the digital world. So the nature of objects and products has changed along the years and dramatically. So our program, I'm sorry, something's going on. Um, our program also is a four year program, four years programs, program and is common foundation. Second year is more related to industrial design and, and tangible. And then we move into interactive objects, system, et cetera, to be well-rounded in this field. Students learn how to design from uh, little objects to devices and with little content of technology. These are audio devices as an example of, oh, these are all students' projects, by the way until systems with uh, technology. This is a system of uh, uh, a, a, a drone developed to help police uh, enforcement, law enforcement to uh, in their job. And uh, also very complex. This is an example of a thesis in which a student designed a, a fully electric uh, sport fishing. Um, another example of projects in mobility. And I skip to the different um, professions that you can um, enter with a, a bachelor in uh, product design, industrial designer, concept designer, user interface, UX, UI, design research, CAD specialist, CMF, uh, color material and finishes experts, for instance, for the automotive industry, design management, entrepreneurship, and becoming, or some, some students decide to become, to enter the fabrication or furniture design specific areas. And the last program we're going to present today is graphic design and interactive media. The program mission is to nurture innovative and inspire designers fluent in 21st century media and focused on designing human experience, uh, human centered experiences. The, the field of graphic design has also evolved. And while we still design for print and uh, we still design identities, um, brand identities and, and you know, uh, all that goes around the, the, the creation of brands. Um, these are examples of logo won our Addi Awards um, in 2020. Uh, we do, as I said, beside doing on graphic for print, so traditional media, these are examples of typography. We're going through all the aspects of what is, uh, is designing communication, visual communications, for traditional and innovative medias, packaging design. When I say innovative medias, obviously I refer to the interactive media. That's why the name of the program. So apps, 
websites and uh, everything that is uh, designing interactions with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the media. So this is an example of an app, obviously that like those on the phones that we use every day. We also go in the, uh, in the field of um, animation and uh, motion graphics, everything that allows and help to build contents to be uh, shared in social media. Most of the communications nowadays go through social media. Um, and we conclude the, 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 the program with uh, two big uh, um, uh, studio, comprehensive studio, final studios. These are an example of that, that try to, to bring uh, the integrated communication together. So the examples that we're gonna hear today from our faculty and how our uh, esteemed alumni uh, for the graphic design uh, and interactive media portions are gonna be, it's gonna be a conversation about some, some of these integrative studio projects in which they have designed an entire campaign. What do you do after you take a bachelor of graphic design and interactive media? You become a graphic designer in, in all these different um, industries and, and, and expressions. Uh, digital production artist, motion graphic, user experience, UX, UI, interaction designer, art director, creative director, branding expert, and, and who knows what else. Sorry, thank you for listening. This was a real rush through what we do at New School. And I stop sharing my screen and I leave it back to um, Adriana to introduce the first round table. Thank Thanks. you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, and so next up, we're actually going into graphic design and interactive media. Um, and uh, Denny, one of the professors for graphic design is going to be uh, speaking to us with her students. Um, and she's going to be introducing um, this class, this project that she put together. And she's going to be having a collaborative discussion with her, her two students. And that's kind of the, the flow of today, actually. So the students are going to be speaking to the professors. They're going to be speaking to one another. And I'll be jumping in and out, asking questions, trying to get the conversation going. So Denny, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and let you take it away. You're muted. not familiar with Zoom as much as I thought I was. Hello, everybody, um, and hopefully looking forward to seeing you all at New School sooner than later. And um, I would like to just touch on the two final classes that, um, amongst others, I teach in the end of the fourth year, and that is Studio Comprehensive Studio 1 and Comprehensive Studio 2. They are the compilation of everything that you learn at New School, and then um, we hit reality. Studio One is where you compile a complete campaign from start to finish, concept, um, research, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and you create original branding, um, advertisements, trade show booths, et cetera, et cetera. You are tasked to do this as though you're an individual freelancer, like a real in, um, designer that's already graduated. So that's what the um, overlook is. I am there to help guide you. Your peers are there to help um, give you input, but it's all yours and you own it all. And I, I think that one of our students today might be able to show you a piece of theirs. Uh, in the end of this class, um, you are to present it to real design professionals whom I invite from outside the school into, so the students also learn how to pitch to a client. Throughout the class, you're also learning about running your own business, creative briefs, inspiration boards, research, etc. The second part of that is uh, that's winter term, then spring term. 
we create a real design situation. We get a real client. The whole class is not individual now. They are part of a team of designers who we pretend work for me as the creative director. They meet the client at a discovery meeting. They learn how to ask the right questions, compile information, find out what their problem is, then go back to their desks, do the research, decide on which roles, who plays what, share ideas, solve all the problems again, motion graphics, branding, um, advertisements, and of course, anything that we say is both either and or electronic or what I call real print, depending. Um, you could do a design of a trade show that's virtual, but you also have to do it in reality because you're gonna have that task. And then again, at the end, you present to the real client and you learn those skills as well. Throughout that, we go over all of the business of running and being part of a design studio as opposed to an individual freelancer. So there's classes throughout there. Um, the students, uh, which I totally enjoy, are, are very mature, hardworking, and also extremely diverse in their interests, capabilities, and where they come from. So it's, um, uh, we run a tough show, all of us, and um, they have forever impressed me regularly, and I always look forward to th these final two classes. So um, I think, Adriana, you can help us start with just introducing <coughs> students and direct the questions how you see most appropriate. Absolutely. So I'm going to let Raquel and Chanel, hi, good morning, ladies, um, introduce themselves. Uh, so I want to know what uh, year you're in and why, where you're from, actually, what state you're from or city you're from, if you're already from California. Or country. Or what country, exactly. Um, I'll start, I guess. Hi, everyone. My name is Chanel. I'm actually an alumni. I graduated um, in June la or this last June. And right now I'm working at a web design agency as an intern. Oh, and I'm from San Diego. <laughs> um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Raquel Sutton, and I'm from Mexico City. And I was an international student. I also was um, I just graduated in June from the, of course, graphic design. And I'm currently living in San Diego, and I'm freelancing right now, but hot, but right now um, hunting for an in-house design job. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you ladies. So walk me through what your experience was specifically in Studio One. What was that like for you? What, did, what was your major takeaway? Um, I can start if you want. So um, um, it was an incredible project. Um, I think that we, well, for myself, I grew so much with that project because we have, we had to thought to think um, about everything. Um, we had to think like it was a project that um, it was initially about um, uh, making um, something about electric cars because in uh, futuristic because in 2035 California will have the uh, electric car um, and they right and um we had to make something about it you know like uh, create like a company that had to do with just electric cars um and then it was incredible to see like all of the students with all of these different ideas that they came up with. super super interesting um chanel you can continue and talk about yeah sure so uh, i feel like the first studio is kind of a culmination of all of the classes that you've taken up until that point. So it's by yourself building a brand and a company concept from the ground up. So I can share my screen really quick to show. And just as Chanel is sharing a reminder that even though it's an individual project, it's as though you're um, working in, a, in like a, a rental space where everybody's got their own cubicle and their own client but you interact constantly with each other. So it's not you take home and you work at home. You all sort of still work together because you need the feedback of each other's 
different perspective so that Chanel doesn't get too focused on something and here's Raquel's input. It's like, I'm not sure if that color is really working. Why is that? Oh, okay. So there's constant individual work and group critiquing throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll just run it through, uh, run through it really quick. <clears throat> but my concept was basically to have a service that transforms vintage and retro cars into electric vehicles kind of bringing the past into the future. Uh, so this was the logo kind of inspired by the Chevrolet emblem. You can see some of my process work here. Here is our colors and patterns. And then we also worked on social media, like how would we actually market and advertise this new company? Uh, we also did a full web design uh, project, which I don't have time to go over the whole thing, but here's a quick little view of some of the stuff we worked on. Uh, and then also actually designing the physical space. So the 3D design and not only thinking how would it look, but how would it flow and how would people use the space? Mm -hmm. uh, and there was just some more process sketches there. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a quick overview of my project for that class. Mm -hmm. And yeah, overall that was a great stepping stone kind of to the next class where it was more of like a team environment. And we all had kind of that basis of building out on our own and now we do it all together for real, for a real client. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate what you're sharing because I think a lot of people think graphic design is just like, just a graphic. It's like something that you see on the side of a, of a bus or on a billboard, that's graphic design. But as you're sharing your project, I see, and this is a lot for the audience, that it's not just a graphic, it's the, the technology that goes with it. It's the app, it's the marketing. Um, and it's you know bringing something from the past into the present and because of 2035 into the future as well. Uh, and I think it's important for the students, the parents, the educators, whoever is in the audience to understand that the program that we have in new school for graphic design and interactive media it's not just graphic design, it's more than that. And so it's more of a complete program uh, and it's very cohesive. It includes a lot of things. Um, I would add also, I'm sorry that I didn't say it at the beginning, but um, as you, as Elena mentioned, we were all working professionals who happen to teach part-time. Mm -hmm. So this is what I do. And it's always a whole concept that starts somewhere or advising a client that they still need to fill in some gaps or which pieces they can start with if they can't afford the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that is where we want to explain to the students, you, you're not going to always get to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. You need to have at least an understanding of the whole umbrella. And, and it's a lot of work just as a student, and, and I know that Chanel can speak to how much work gets compressed and, and pressured from the reality point the day after you, you walk into a real experience like the internship she's having. Um, I also wanted to add that um, uh, we also had to create like names and taglines yep. that, that's, that was super important for our minds to get going. You know, it's not just about um, giving you like a probably a client might come with a name that's like usually how that's in real life but sometimes um, they want they want to them to give like they want to give um, how can I say it like um, their um, give our like feedback with like names mm -hmm. strategy you know like marketing and yeah. um, so it just got our minds to get going towards that way to creativity and um, it was like amazing. It also I think speaks to as, as Raquel has uh, indicated that she freelances that when you are asked by a client to help solve a problem you need to have insight into what copywriting is and naming and marketing strategy and etc even if that's not your expertise to understand it enough to help maybe correct the client, direct the client, or subcontract and bring in Chanel or Elena or Dario or whomever to help complete that project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are, are a whole package. You're just not graphic Absolutely. designers. You are designers and entrepreneurs 
and really good listeners and having to yes. collaborate with other people, et cetera. So not just graphic designing. And so new school prepares students, not just for the design part, that's what you're going to school for, it's to design, but it's also to actually work in a real life environment. And so that was kind of the basic idea behind this class, correct, Dani? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think that um, what Chanel showed, um, shows that in, it's all hers. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, you know, that's so real. Absolutely. So the preparation, it's right there. You saw it right there. That's real. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chanel, for sharing. Raquel, would you like to share something from Studio One or from Studio Two? It's up to you. Um, I think I can share from Studio Two just to uh, move forward a little bit. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so we had this real client that um, it's from American College of the Building Arts, which is a college um, located in the East Coast. Okay. And yeah. And um, they wanted a branding and um, like they had these uh, old logo and the, their whole branding, they wanted to, well, renovate it, you know, like update it. So we went through um, um, a lot of stuff with team. We were seven in our team. And uh, a good thing to point out was that we, it was a very diverse team. We were from six different countries and, um, you know, different, total different backgrounds. So it was hard and it was really challenged to work together because yeah. everybody had like so many points of views, um, age difference. I want to point out that as well. <laughs> um, and, um, but it was incredibly how we came up with the branding and um, the whole concept. Um, we also uh, created the tagline as well. And um, of course, color palette, I'm gonna scroll through a little bit, um, the like horizontal logo and then the vertical option logo. And then um, the tagline, as you can see, um, the icon as well that we created and everything was, um, from the feedback that we had from the real client that we had a meeting with them so we can have like um, their insight, you know, from the school, their needs, um, a really long conversation that we uh, could get all the information that we needed to create this whole branding and concept for their school. It's, it's called a client discovery meeting, which they had and prepared um, thoroughly, even what questions to ask, who to ask the questions, what follow-up questions to ask so they could get as much information as possible. So that happened in the second or third week, I forget, something like that. Okay, um, and then we added these motion graphics as well um, for the website, as you can see. It has audio, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> They, they did an amazing presentation. So that's the landing page for the website that's before crazy. getting into the website, you see the animation. And then um, this is a great design that we came up for the website that um, they really had like this busy and very um, um, like confusing uh website so we order stuff out and um try to do it more um user experience easy user experience mm -hmm. for students to uh, get into their website and find whatever they needed mm -hmm. as you can see um here are some examples of um some of the web pages the areas of study um everything with their information we also call this a design direction. 
So although the students are completely capable of turning it into a real website, we didn't have time. So it is, it is a, what I call a design direction to present to a client. If they're interested, then we get into, okay, now you've got to give us lots more information, lots more time and a little bit of money. But Correct. This is obviously <laughs> a student project. So we, we walk that tightrope, but you can see from the design direction, the amount of work and thoroughness and elegance, they all came yes. together and produced. Now, you said something really interesting, Raquel. You said user experience, because again, we think graphic design and it's just a static image somewhere in a corner of the world. But what you guys are creating is also for the user experience, which means a human being is going to have to interact with what you are creating. And so it needs to be easy to access, easy to use. It needs to keep your attention. It needs to make sure that you're going to stay on that image or on that website, or you're, for example, you're showing Instagram, you're on that social media profile. Um, and that's a huge part of graphic design as well. And it's something that I wanted to bring up and say to the audience as well. Um, and this is something that, uh, for example, in this particular class, what the students are learning and, and, and putting into practice. Now, Chanel and Raquel, uh, before this class, because both of you are now graduating, before this class, uh, especially Raquel, I remember you saying um, that you were a designer before going to school and you had your experience and then you went to school and you learned design from an, an, an academic point of view and then you graduated and now you're working freelance, right? And Chanel, you're also, you've graduated and now you're working um, as a designer. How was this class or was this class beneficial to your experience? What did it lend you? What did it give you once you graduated? Yeah, I think the main thing for me, since I am working on with the design team right now, this kind of gave me insight into how it actually is working with a team and balancing different, not only design styles, but personalities and how you kind of navigate that in a professional way. Um, I think also just time management, this, this class specifically really helps everyone get on the same schedule. And I think that was like a key part of um, me kind of succeeding in the internship I'm at right now, because I, I can talk with my team and we can make a plan how, how we're actually gonna finish on time. Absolutely, no. Um, communication is I think something that is very much overlooked and the communication styles and how to say something directly and clearly for others to understand so that you can get the project going, I think is very important. And even what Raquel said, like we were all different age groups and we we're all different uh, from different cultures. And so everybody has their own way of communicating and approaching things. Um, and everybody, even if you're from the same city, literally the same block, everybody has their own personality. I will uh, um, add Adriana and, and maybe Chanel can, um, uh, comment on this, which is a little different maybe with the virtual world, but the assumption today that uh, designers plug in, have their computer and nothing else, um, it's really an illusion. It doesn't mean you don't have time where you sit and you zone out mm -hmm. and design digitally, paper, whatever, but it it is much more collaborative. And I think um, even Chanel mentioned to me the other day um, that you can, why don't you just say what you told me the other day about your experience with the screen and, you know, that aspect. Just as far as like collaborati collaborating, you collaborating or having your screen on or having somebody kind of digitally walk by or right. responding to it, you know, so if you're not in the actual studio, it still has evolved yeah, like, to. I work uh, partly remotely and sometimes I go into the office, but basically when I am working remote, I'm, we're still constantly collaborating uh, and basically Zoom calls like this saying, oh no, we have to move this here. No, this won't work. This looks great. So yeah, collaboration is kind of a huge part of design and mm -hmm. successful design, especially. Yeah, people are very much part of the process. Uh, thank you for sharing, Chanel. Raquel, what about you and your story? Well, how was this class beneficial to you? Um, well, first of all, um, taking it uh, again virtually changed mm -hmm. everything. 
So um, I learned how to deal with my teammates just, you know, without even meeting them. Um, and um, I feel that like with clients, it's been now like super easy just to, um, you know, set meetings, getting everybody involved in the meeting, everybody involved in that design. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the good side of the pandemic, that helped a lot. Um, I can still reach my clients in Mexico City and it's been like super easy. Mm -hmm. um, also, as a designer, uh, I feel that I grew so much um, with like the environment, um, with like the disciplines that Danny, like, you know, um, the, um, the path that she taught, took us to, um, you know, how you have to get from one thing to another, how to get organized with mm -hmm. one another's, how not to be so nice with the other, um, <laughs> you know, students. You have to reinterpret that. Right. <laughs> Professional you know, is what I want, not. Exactly. Because, <laughs> you know, maybe because it's your friend, maybe you're right. afraid of, um, you know, um, you know, affecting their feelings or something like that. But um, mm -hmm. It's just like, a, you know, a thing that um, you have to have a mindset that it is professional. So Always. like this helped me a lot. You know, sometimes I get like um, from like just clients and um, I have to explain the why of I'm doing things. Mm -hmm. And this class taught me that as well, you know, and also clients can help understand your design. You know, it's not just like designing um because i like it or because i like the colors or you know everything has to have a value everything has to have a um meaning behind whatever you're doing for the company and um now i understand that that will make the company successful you know because everything has a has to be um with a meaning Mm -hmm. Everything has to have a meaning in design, whatever it is, the name, the color, um, the tagline, um, the Instagram, the tone, the voice. Yeah. So the practically everything. No, yeah, everything is intentional. Nothing is accidental. Exactly. There's a purpose to everything. And that's why, in a way, uh, being a designer, too, um, burns a lot of, of neurons, you know, because you're really having to think of every single detail and like, why am I doing this? is this on purpose or do I like it because it's pretty or I like it because it matches my personality? Mm -mm, no, it's not about you. Uh, and I think uh, that's what I'm hearing. It's like, it's not about me. It's about the project. It's about the client. It's about the, the final goal. Um, I would also add that it, it, it sounds like it's very intense. It is. Again, I can think, I think that both of them can say since of the different work they've done, how intense it is. Um, there is a lot of there's still enjoyment and humor going on with whether you're working with somebody um, or, or you're working with a group that, you know, when I would dip into the different groups and it was like, all right, enough of the giggling, make a choice, guys, stop it. You know, you know it was, uh, it, it was productive, but it was an enjoyable, intense kind of experience for me to observe. And I think for the students, the young designers to participate in. They also each had different roles, but then they kind of shared the need for critique constantly. So that was also an experiment they, they had um, that I think worked productively for their now future mm -hmm. professional lives. Absolutely. It is uh, intense, but it's rewarding. You know, Absolutely. if it were easy, anybody would do it. And the heart is what makes it good, right? That's from that one, a league of their own, right? The heart is what makes it great. So uh, Raquel, Chanel, Denny, thank you so much for giving us your insight about your experience, your takeaways, your aha moments uh, in this collaborative uh, class. I really appreciate it. Students that are uh, attendees, if you have any questions, please drop it in the chat. Um, we would love to hear your questions. Uh, or if you just want to comment on something, we'd love to have it. Uh, Chanel and Raquel and Denny, as you can hear, we're our professional people. And so they are going to have to log out and keep working. Yeah. Keep putting everything that they've learned to the test. Uh, so again, thank you so much to the three of you. I really appreciate it.
And um, for the time being, we're actually going to jump into a break. We're going to give you a stretching break, a water break, a bathroom break. So I'm going to give you five minutes and we'll be back at 1050. So everybody make sure to return at 1050 because we're going to jump right into product design. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.
Well, maybe while we're waiting for Adriana, I can introduce Dario Miticocchio, our uh, faculty member, um, uh, is the, the, the level coordinator for all first year, common first year, and specialized in product design, is going to present um, this group of uh, incredible product design students. And maybe you can start introducing yourself, Dario and Amza. Jeffrey, here she is. Oh, here's Adriana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. We were we were getting started. You you guys like got excited. You're like, you know what? I'm just gonna start this thing. Yeah. Okay, um, let me see if I can find Frida. There she is. I'm gonna spotlight her as well. So I don't know what you guys have been saying, but welcome back from the break. We're very excited to have you here. Next up, we have product design. And Dario, I know that you've been talking. So Dario, he is the professor, or here. He is a professor for product design. And uh, a few of his students are here today. So I'm gonna ask you guys to um, introduce yourselves, what year you're in and what countries or city you are from. Uh, so I guess, do I go first? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Dario Miticocchio. I'm from uh, uh, an year a long time ago. <laughs> and I was born and raised in Milan, Italy. Excellent. Now on my screen, I have Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, go ahead and introduce yourself, what year you're in and uh, where you're from. So hello, guys. My name is Jeffrey. Um, I'm a, a product design Third year to fourth year. Well, this quarter, next quarter, gonna be our our fourth year. Um, I am born and raised from uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Hello, Hamza. everyone. Yeah, hello, Hamza. What about you? Where are you from, and uh, what year are you in? Hello, everybody. I'm from uh, Casablanca, Morocco. I'm a fourth year product designer with Jeffrey and Frida in class. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Frida, what about you? Hi, guys. Nice to meet you. My name is Frida Moreno. I am from Sonora, Mexico. And as Hamza mentioned, um, I am also a fourth year. Uh, both of them are my classmates as well. <laughs> That's great. Now, what I love about this group of students that are speaking today just across all of the programs is that everybody um, like um, Raquel had said earlier today is from a different part of the world, a different uh, culture, and so everybody has their own approach to projects. Uh, and now, Dario, I know that uh, these students have projects to share. Um, yeah, I was going to start first with a, like a, maybe a brief introduction of sure. myself and product design, and then uh, show some examples of uh, what we do in first year, which goes for all three programs, but I think shows the the radical transdisciplinary mindset that product designers need. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, first of all, like Elena said, I teach uh, basically the foundation sequence to all students in the School of Design. So interior graphics and product. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I focus primarily on product in the upper classes. Um, I come from a school of architecture. I come from Europe and design in Europe it has a different meaning. Uh, we see design as a holistic activity where you're designing the world around you. It's not one thing, it's everything. And so for us, it's very natural to think uh, across design discipline. And I think some of it is came up earlier in hearing the presentation from, I actually took a bunch of notes that changed what I was gonna say after <laughs> hearing Raquel and Chanel talk, because I think there's important notes there. Uh, she, Raquel mentioned the word why. You always have to tell about why your design is a certain way. That's something that has always been very central to the life of a product designer, mm -hmm. because product designers have to convince people in business meetings, whereas oftentimes, for instance, interior designers just have to convince a client that they're doing something beautiful. Mm -hmm. In in product design, there is usually some hefty production investment at play, 
and therefore the conversations have a very factual uh, tone. Mm -hmm. So understanding how to frame all your uh, proposals in terms of why is this a benefit is a, is a key ingredient of what we teach. The other thing that is very important in the way we approach our teaching is some schools focus heavily on the execute part. They produce, they produce great production artists. Mm -hmm. And we do everything we can to make sure that you can develop those, uh, those muscles as well. Although that, that's very much dependent on the path that you choose because that's, that's a vertical skill that you have to develop on your own to some degree. But we do focus very heavily on the thinking part. And that's where design thinking comes in where you, if you think clearly about what you're developing, it's gonna be a lot more uh, um, successful to explain your solution in business terms. And that's something that we care about a lot. Uh, you're muted, Dario. Oh, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> that was me actually, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, another thing that Elena brought up earlier that I think is, uh, is very important is that product design has changed a lot. And we should actually preface that with the, the idea that product design is the least known of the design discipline. Most people don't even realize that that's a job, mm -hmm. but we all use objects every day. Every single one of those objects have been designed. And most people think that that's something that engineer, engineers do. Mm -hmm. And that is only partially true. Uh, engineers participate in the, in the activity. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, the idea for a project kind of starts from a designer. The engineers mm -hmm. are involved in the development. So that's what product designers do. Um, so it's a great direction for curious people, for people that have a bit of a technical uh, mindset. It's, uh, there's a lot of technical knowledge involved, but it's not engineering. It also has a lot of cultural and emotional understanding involved. So it's this, I call this a bridge discipline. It's something that connects words with different languages and with different values. Um, I'm gonna show, uh, well, first of all, brief image of uh, uh, my past so that you get a sense where I'm coming from. If I, okay, share screen. Um, are you guys seeing this slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is some examples of uh, uh, things that I worked on in my life. Like I said, I studied architecture, but I moved across all disciplines. This is showing primarily some product design range. Mm -hmm. And I've worked both in as an in-house designer and as a, a consultant mm -hmm. for equal amount of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna show you some examples from the final project of first year, mm -hmm. which is a project that the students do that is uh, in a way a precursor to what Danny does in the comprehensive studio. So the students are asked, and they, at this point they're still all together, all disciplines are studying together, mm -hmm. and they have to invent a drink and present it with a solution for all the different aspects from a graphic design standpoint, from a product design standpoint, packaging uh, and things like that. Yes. And, and uh, the space that this drink will be promoted in. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the mindset that we um, we show in front, you're seeing this, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Break. Uh, you see this student conceived this uh, charcoal uh, chumbuka <laughs> lemonade, <laughs> uh, and this is a mood board to start getting a sense of the type of lifestyle that this drink fits in, and then she talks about what's inside and how she came up with the logo and her choices of, uh, you know, composition, mm -hmm. then some inspiration. We always try to put, make sure that there's some uh, also cultural references in the work for the packaging, 
this is a oh. unique drink, so a unique packaging to make sure that this uniqueness comes true. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some ideas on how it can be promoted around and the space that it can be served in. So this is obviously the environment that she was looking for was a beach environment. This is our first Sorry. project. So obviously they're still developing their, their you know, representation muscles. But I think for first year projects, they're pretty, they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And actually, I have some comments on so much of what you've been saying. Uh, I went out in the field and I'm talking to students that are in high school and community college. They ask, well, you know, what is the difference between an engineer and a product designer? I mean, it sounds like the same thing. And you, you literally said it's not the same thing. They can collaborate with one another. But the person that conceives of the idea of a product is first the designer. And then they collaborate with the engineer to make it happen. Um, yeah. And then that, is, actually... that is oftentimes the case. There's a, let's just say that designers, product designers need to be very good at conversing with other disciplines mm -hmm. uh, because you, you are constantly interacting with many other disciplines, most specifically marketing and engineering, but oftentimes others, you know, logistics. You'll see in Hamza's project mm -hmm. that there is some logistic consideration that need to be factored in as well. Absolutely. Uh, there is a uh, uh, you need to talk about you need to talk to users you need to understand what motivates users you're not designing for yourself you don't design the things that you like you design the things that your users will like exactly. exactly so it's definitely a discipline that is rich with many nuances mm -hmm. i think it's the, the the most interesting on the tree in the sense that because it's constantly changing and evolving faster than the other ones yeah. there's always something new to learn there's always something different to do so mm -hmm. i find it always engaging for that reason mm -hmm. absolutely and also people don't think about products they buy products they consume products they use it all the time but they don't think about the ideas and the thoughts that went behind creating the product so like you said people don't even know that product design is a major it's not something that they did they don't know that it's something that you can study that you can pursue that you can learn and then do as a profession uh and that's why i mean one of the reasons why we did this event it's so that people could understand that everything that you're using whether it's a mouse or it can be um a coffee cup it could be anything somebody designed that somebody designed everything the chair that you're sitting on the phone that you're on right now because i know you're on your phone even though you're present in this event um, somebody had to design it and there was a lot of thought into it. And I like that you call product design, a, a I think you said it was like a bridging discipline. Yeah, I call it a bridge discipline. Yeah. Bridge discipline. I love that. I'm going to have to steal that from you where you're bridging the technicality and also the design of it. I was reading an art history book and like in the mid 1800s, there was a, an art commentator that said, you have to make things beautiful. Um, because if you're just going to make something utilitarian, it's somehow, it, it's lost in translation. They said that the most utilitarian thing you can use is a toilet and it's not a beautiful thing. <laughs> so you can make things that you can use like a toilet, but it's not a particularly beautiful thing. And so a product designer has to bridge those two things, right? The technicality of it and the beauty and the design, something that's going to make people want to use the product. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Do I show another example? Do we go jump into the students? Uh, I, I would actually love to hear from the students. I want to hear, okay, let's, you know, let's, their projects and what they've been up to. Um, and I'm sharing. Yes, it was Frida, right? You're going first. Hello, guys. Um, I'll be sharing my screen so that you guys can see an example of a project that we did during our second year last quarter. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. Let me know if you can see the screen. Give me a second. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Frida Moreno. Um, and I want to talk about Bamboost, which is one of my favorite projects. The professor in charge of this project asks us to design a medical product for rural areas of African communities. So in order to be able to design for a specific target audience, such as rural areas of Africa, you need to do specific research. Um, for example, observational research, you have to empathize with the user, as Dario said, 
we have to try and find like real user needs. And after doing in-depth research, I found that over 75,000 children were paralyzed by the polio virus in the 90s during this um, times in those rural areas of Africa. So I was like, how can we solve this problem? Um, this, the kids grew up, right? Um, they're currently young adults, men and women. They have to work in the city. They have to travel really long distances for living necessities like water, making the disabled community's quality of life in this demographic really unequal due to the lack of mobility aids in the area. So what do, did we need to do? Uh, we needed to design a mobility aid for these people that could be adapted into their own environment. So this is the Bamboo Crutch, which aims to boost the disabled rural African communities' um, quality of life through a feasible and sustainable approach. Um, it was designed to adapt to the uneven terrain in Africa and these zones and areas. Um, it's shock absorbent. It's made from bamboo, which is also vastly and readily available in many regions of Africa. So what I want to um, tell to maybe future students or people interested in the career is that design um, is not um, as vain as people may think. It carries a lot of responsibility. It isn't easy, but it feeds me a lot with motivation to change everything that is around me. And it really helps you to appreciate the little things and the details in life. So that's that's why uh, through through the process of designing this project, I I, it, I came to the realization um, of that. <laughs> I love that you say that. Um, one of the things that I tell people in the field or students in the field is that, you know, you're a designer once or a product designer in this case when you're using a product and you're thinking i could make this better i can tweak yeah. this and make this <laughs> better and so here basically at new school we're here to, to ruin you we want you to be walking around the world and think that could be better that could be designed better that can be tweaked blah blah, blah. um and just so that you're you're constantly thinking how to improve things and make it more user-friendly correct um yeah. and i remember frida you had said that you had to do a lot of research before um being able to dive into the design of this product. Can you walk us through that a little? Yeah, so uh, we start by researching. I personally research uh, through academic research papers mm -hmm. and I found like statistics like qualitative research and then quantitative research as well. And then from both, um, you have to come up with your own conclusions and filter out information. And the important part is that product design, I feel like, is a lot about filtering your information, what is actually valuable and what isn't. And for example, I realized that there was a lot of donations um, regarding crutches from the United States to Africa, but the crutches that arrived um, in Africa were all worn out and practically unusable. So there was also an issue in transportation, which is why I didn't um, make make it out of metal. I made it out of bamboo, which is readily available in the region because they deserve quality. Um, people yes. could yes, they, people deserve quality. It doesn't matter what type of product it is, um, but specifically more for mobility aids, people weren't mm -hmm. requiring that there. So that was also a need that I found. Exactly. So, yeah. It's going back to user experience. You can create something, but if it's going to break within four uses, what's the point? Exactly. You're harming the individual that's using it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thank you for bringing that to to the forefront. It's not like, hmm, I feel it looks like Africa needs crutches. Let me just design something really quick. No, you had to do a deep dive into yeah. the culture, into the needs, into the even the terrain and the geo uh, geography. The geography I mean, was so important. Yeah, I mean, and it depends. I mean, because Africa is a huge continent. And there are different regions. There's desert, there's cities, there's, you know, wildlife and country. Yes. And so you got to think, where is it, this exactly going? Who is using it in what part of Africa, you know? Uh, thank you so much for sharing this. This is a really fantastic example of what a product designer needs to do in order to create and execute an excellent product. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think Jeffrey's the next one. All right, take it away. Well, hello guys, I'm Jeffrey. So today, instead of projects, I'm gonna share, share you some of my takeaway over the three years, almost four years experience. Um, so let's get started. So 
for my uh, the first thing I want to share is you guys can you guys see it if yes the, yes okay it's sketching so <laughs> a lot of people neglect this part but sketching what I learned about sketching it's sketching is really important as a, to, a skill in product design mm -hmm. no matter and we start from like you can see the bottom right a really ugly bottle to all the way to fancy digital drawings but the reason why I learned this is important is we are product designer. We are bringing the vision, not just, not just to the engineer. Sometimes we have to draw the vision. We have, we have to paint the vision for mm -hmm. our clients. Sometimes they don't know what they're thinking. We, so with the sketching, it's a really quick and easy tool to put out the vision mm -hmm. for our clients. And you also show you about know, kind of show off like, yeah, I can draw. No. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the, uh, but, and another thing it's don't hesitate to show people your work. That's another thing I learned. Don't, don't hesitate to show your sketching. Even though it's ugly, it start rough. Everybody start the same. The matter of what it's you practice, you learn what's the right way to do and practice. So by, and how do you do that? By showing people and showing to Dario, showing to Elena, they will give you the advice, uh, oh, the perspective is a little bit off, the, the portion, proportion is a little bit off. Mm -hmm. But by learning, I think it's always more efficient that learning the right thing 10 times than just practice on your own, but it's the wrong way a thousand times. Yes, and, and I'm, glad, I'm glad you bring that up because a lot of students in the field ask me, well, I, I really wanna go into design because I think it's cool and I like it, but I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to sketch. So what would you say to those students then? So that's all, just like all the professors say, practice. That's, there's no shortcut of it. No I, can, I, I can add to that. that. Drawing is a much more natural skill than writing. Yet we all can write because we spent years practicing it. But you, as a general tool set, we are much better keep for drawing. And we did that before we even discovered writing. So everybody can draw. Now, the problem is some people think that they need to draw at a certain quality for it to be even useful. And that mm -hmm. is a lie. You need to draw well enough so that you can have a conversation with a mental conversation with your drawing. Because mm -hmm. drawing is not just to present, is to think, is to think visually. And then Bravo. with practice, you become good enough to show it off and then you can be proud of it. But even before it becomes showable and, and beautiful it's mm -hmm. it's already useful it's a way to uh visualize your thoughts and check them and and verify them and iterate on them mm -hmm. yeah. and that, was, that was almost poetic that you that was that was poetic for me that was yes i'm gonna have to steal that one as well uh yeah. go ahead jeffrey so you can you can see like dario say i start with the like that bottle and all the way out the spiral it's there's no shortcut uh, well, there there is just by asking, but the only way to professionalism is practice. Mm -hmm. There's that's it, and don't hesitate to show people, show the professor. You are in a university, a place to make mistakes and make learn, but you cannot do it after you go to the professional level. Mm -hmm. So university, it's the last place you can make mistake. <laughs> yeah, well, your mistakes here. <laughs> it's true. I, uh, yeah, 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 Dario. And the next <laughs> is about next my milestone is tools and experience. Uh, by learning the this again, this is a university. What I learned, this is a university. We they're gonna teach you the philosophy, the basic, the mentality. But product design is such a unique way. You can like you cannot count on the class to teach you everything. You want to design stuff like me and Frida. And Hamza, we all use different programs to do different stuff. We all good at different things. So you can see you have to spend your class uh, out of class time the, to learn, to, to be better at yourself, to make, to think a better way to make your project look better. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're the way is you have to explore different tools, different experiences outside. And don't hesitate to see the, the other disciplines professor. Just grab them, shake them down for their advice. That's always helpful. That's, that's actually what I did, what I do. Uh, uh, but it's really helpful. Like 
all the all those tools, Photoshop, Blender. Um, the more tool you learn, you can based on what product you use, you will be more adaptable, mm -hmm. and you your your mind will be more open about new things. Just like Dario said, product design constantly changing. There's no way that we we can keep up the tool in the class, yeah. but the philosophy, the mindset, it's the core thing is always there. Correct. And tool experience as a student, a part of our obligation is to, as a unit, college student, mm -hmm. self-motivation and push us to make our product look better. Mm -hmm. And and you will learn it's actually a lot of fun. Like uh, you, if you want to get real, rapidly prototype you learn how to do a 3d printing you learn how to make a woodwork mm -hmm. it's just fun yeah and our 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 school it, they provide perfect environment for the material lab you can experience all of this mm -hmm. and find the right class to take that's also important so yeah no i'm that's, glad that that you brought up um the material, well, you didn't say materials lab, but at the university, we have a materials lab and they're like these big machineries that help you manipulate different materials such as wood, such as steel, such as, you know, foam, et cetera. And we do have a 3D printer on campus. So thank you for bringing that up. Now, when you say tools, you know, materials lab and different technologies, I understand that part and experience. Do you also mean that you as a human being, you as a person go out and experience different can you expand on that a little bit? So the experience means both. Uh, the thing is the experience about the tools. Mm -hmm. That's of course, you have to get familiar with this. So constantly practice. And the experience about uh, being familiar with what you want to design. So you, it's for like Frida, she will, we sometimes do experience that we, we, we do a rapidly uh, prototype and we experience how it feel. And we experience how the people think all kind of experience mm -hmm. as a product design. It's, it's helpful. It's just help you grow. Mm -hmm. And the last but not least, last but not least, it's research and collaboration. This I show you. It's just a peak of what designers' mind, oh, well, my crazy mind is. This is a project <laughs> that I work with the uh, upper class, uh, which they are graduate, fantastic people, and we have uh, our whiteboard. Yeah, we take take a corner of school's whiteboard, mm -hmm. and we we collaborate it and through the internet it's which is making it more difficult even harder for it but we actually it's the the way we learn in the school to how to research like Frida mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and um how to collaborate and how to work with the other that's really important how to work with the other the word choice the how to distribute the word not just over overwork yourself mm -hmm. it's really helpful and this is the part that people think we don't have to do, but we actually, this is the most important part, research. Research and a collaboration, talk. You always, to make these things work, we always have to talk, to, to, to discuss, to, to learn each other, what they're thinking and find a midpoint or find the better solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the researching part is crucial. You can see all the things, all the sticker notes. Yeah. It's about piece of our ideas being show and being read and we well thought of mm -hmm. then we put on it and this collaboration shows all the like good like all the co compress all the information you need as a product design research sketching mm -hmm. 3d modeling mm -hmm. low fidelity uh, low fidelity prototyping high fidelity so I think that's the reason why I put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is fantastic. It looks like the post-it is your favorite, is your best friend, right? Having to write, oh, like post-its all over the place. Oh, this idea, this idea. Let's connect this with yes, this. Yes. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for sharing your insight of what, what you've learned and, and your biggest takeaway uh, as being a product design student at New School. Thank you. Hamza, last but certainly not least, talk to us. Hello, everybody. Um, I really love the the talk that is going on, and uh, I like I like to think that uh, the that product design is super versatile, and that's what's fun is the fact that it's a wide range of of uh, uh, things you can design. 
Mm -hmm. um, here in one of the projects is I had to design a coffee, uh, a coffee maker. And so the idea is completely different and, uh, and not like a regular coffee maker. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey talked about a very important uh, aspect of being a product designer is to be visionary and to envision the ideas that you have in space. This way you can have a complete project. And during this, uh, this year, when I designed this project, I learned that for like the first five weeks, I feel like I failed because I did not envision how the product uh, was going to be like in terms of uh, the, the, um, the bar, where I'm setting the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, after five weeks, I realized that I needed to put more work than I already did. So then I put the bar really, really high uh, and I came up with this set of products as well with like a, learning how to do video animation and rendering with high quality rendering. So it, it took me a lot of work, but I learned so much. And I feel like that process is really important and fun as well. Mm -hmm. um, another project I worked on was um, designing a hospital bed for Africa. So currently I'm a shareholder of a company uh, called Valcare in Casablanca, Morocco, mm -hmm. but I'm also the product designer. So uh, I decided to merge um, my career life with my studio project, uh, which my teachers allowed me to do so. And I wanted to design a hospital bed. Uh, and really the, the importance of um, being a product designer is also being able to communicate clearly. So communicate visually also, but then communicate also verbally with the different teams. So. In my experience, I had to communicate with engineers. I had to communicate with um, the financial part of, of, um, of the company to, to see how can we produce this bed and how can we sell it and make money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, as Dario mentioned earlier, product design can, it is technical. So it gets technical. And so at the end of the day, you want to have a product that is feasible. So you can go crazy with the ideas, which is great, but then you have to bring it back on earth and try to make it feasible. This whole point of this project was to make a hospital bed uh, that can be transported um, to, triple, uh, to triple the transportation in terms of how many beds in a 40 feet container. Mm -hmm. And uh, this bed was, uh, was able to do that. We also was able to sell this bed at 33% less than what it already wow. is. Um, and also in terms of production, instead of producing 100 beds per week, it would be uh, 600 beds per week. Mm -hmm. So the goal was really to increase and give the company such a competitive product mm -hmm. so that um, the competitors won't be able to, to follow up. Mm -hmm. Um, also, Jeffrey spoke about a very important thing is the technical skills that you need as a product designer. So not only sketching, but also the tools you use on the computers, maybe 3D modeling or rendering. Uh, perhaps you want to do animation. Uh, it depends on what's your goal and what's your story. At the end of the day, everything is a story. Um, I've also worked on another project where I had to create um, two applications and six products. The, this was on a, in a studio class where um, the task was to merge these six products and apps in order to, to uh, achieve a certain, uh, a certain goal. And imagine having, having to pre present this to a bunch of uh, uh, studio professors. So it was really hard for me uh, to do that until I realized that I had to create a storyline uh, which is cohesive. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to organize myself. I feel like organization as a product designer is really important mm -hmm. in, in every single bit of either communicating or, or just tackling the project itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanted to thank you for your transparency. Um, when you were introducing the coffee maker at the beginning, you said, oh, I felt like I failed, but then I learned from it and I kept going. And I think that's a really good life lesson. And it's a good lesson for being a product designer. It's you're doing it one way and you're like, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'm going to have to whoop, 
change direction and do it a different way. So thank you for your, um, for uh, your transparency in that. And I think it's very cool that um, for this company, Valcare, that you're working for or you're a shareholder for, you're also able to do product design as well. I think that's really cool. And you're able to put the skills that you're learning at new school right here, right now. And especially something that you have such a big, um, uh, what's it called? Um, you have a lot at stake in this, right? So you gotta make sure that what you're creating is, is good because you're being affected by it as well. So um, thank Great. you so much for the four of you for talking us through um, product design, uh, your takeaways, what you've learned, what you have created, because I think it shows our audience members what they also can create, what they also can design. And I tell students out in the field all the time, they say, well, I like this and I like design. And I say, okay, well, that one thing that you think is separate from design, don't lose your spark in that. Don't lose your interest in that because you can always design for that interest. And since you're so interested in that one thing, um, that means that you are, you have experience in that. That means that you can design properly for it because of of your interest in it. So thank you to the four of you for um, introducing us to your own little product design world. So thank you. Uh, next up, we have interior architecture and design and we have Denise Holm and Sequoia Nelson uh, speaking with us today. So let me remove the spotlights for everybody here. And then I will spotlight our next speakers. Uh, and I also want to encourage everybody that's in the Audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will be happy to answer your questions. Um, it's a, also a really good way for us to interact with our speakers today. Uh, so Denise Holm, Professor of Interior Architecture and Design and Sequoia student in the program as well. Thank you for coming, welcome. We're very happy you're here. Um, and so Denise, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and talk us through the class that Sequoia had to take uh, and then we'll transition over to Sequoia. Oh, you are muted, Denise. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I want to welcome all of you. And Sequoia, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, Sequoia is out on the East Coast. I'm here in, in California. Um, actually, the class that we wanted to talk about today in interior architecture and design is, I, I'm going to say it's probably one of my favorites. Um, as a practicing professional and a, uh, a member of the faculty, it's always really uh, wonderful for me to be able to give my students uh, situations in the classroom that are uh, as lifelike and as realistic as possible. And so during spring quarter, uh, we have this incredible opportunity for the interior architecture third year spring quarter students to collaborate with the fourth year, uh, fourth year um, uh, third quarter spring quarter architecture students. And so what's unique about this project is that every year it's a real project. This year it was the ODOT uh, blocks project, which is an urban, I wanna call it an urban reimagination project um, west of the river in downtown Portland. And the architecture students come into spring quarter having spent two previous quarters um, doing research, master planning, um, and they come in with, a, with this quite significant background. And as they enter spring quarter, they're now starting to work on um, more significant building massing, uh, building systems, structural issues, um, HVAC in particular, as well as elements of sustainability. And so my students come in uh, literally, bang, they are dropped into this project. <laughs> they know they have to scramble. Um, so it's very real world. This is what happens to, to interior people all the time. It's like you're brought onto the project, oftentimes not at the inception. And so you've missed all of that kind of collaborative work. And so not only do you have to find your land legs, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, professionally, but you have to then also design. And um, there is always a deadline. And so I think that Sequoia will probably <laughs> be sharing some, some of the issues. Plus, 
uh, one of the, the advantages I think of our school is that, you know, there are very few interior programs that are nestled or nested in a school of architecture. Mm -hmm. So this is a very unique opportunity for our students to collaborate with with architects because that's what they're going to be doing in in the field you know when they graduate they're going to be spending a lot of time with not only architects but other stakeholders clients and you know all of the trades and you know the various other uh, parts or components of a project and so um i'm always very proud of what what they design simply because they have to work very closely with the architects which can sometimes be a challenge because mm -hmm. they're on two uh, parallel tracks but they have different sets of, of class deliverables and um and i just think it's a wonderful project and i hope sequoia will feel the same way and i don't want to take too much time going on and on about it we'll let sequoia talk a bit about what her experiences were in the class well, thank you, Denise, so much for that. And what I'm hearing already is that there is a difference between interior architecture and design and architecture, Absolutely. which is something that I get asked in the field, too. It's like, well, you know, if I like interior design, why should I go into interior architecture and design? Um, well, one of the things about architecture, Adriana, is that our interior architecture is it does take place inside of architecture. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so um, whether you call it in interior design or interior architecture or whatever, um, mm -hmm you know, you are restricted by the physical space. And so uh, the structural, I mean, it's easy enough for an interiors person to go in and say, oh, well, I think we should move that wall and we can open up that and put a window there. When in fact, that's really not the way that life works in our world, that uh, oftentimes there's restrictions, structural restrictions, and literally the building is not going to stand up if, you know, you make these these proposed changes. And so okay. it's very much a learning experience where you have to think about the architecture in this class and be the designer um, that is working on the interior. So mm -hmm. no, very project. well put. You think interior design is in the interior of the architectural building. Yep. That's so it. they're not they're not divorced from each other. They're actually very much married. They're married, yep. they're living together and they have five kids. You can't you can't That's separate that. them. Yep. You can't um, just move the building systems because it fits your your furniture plan. Yeah. Uh, you have to work together as this very well oiled team. And so it's a fantastic experience for the students. Excellent. Thank you, Denise. Now Sequoia, hello to you. Now I think Hi. you're very special interior architecture and design student because you actually didn't start off studying this, correct? Mm -hmm. I actually started in the architecture program and I was in the architecture program for a year and a half before mm -hmm. I um, transitioned to the interior architecture program. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And so what year yeah. are you in right now? I'm going into my last year. So I'm going to be doing my thesis um, next year. Yay, congrats. <laughs> Very excited about that. And then where are you from? Um, I originally grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a little time in um, Sacramento, also in Washington. So been all over. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I just I remember. I have to agree with everything Denise said about the project. I think it was one of the most beneficial projects that um, I have done in interior design so far because of the collaboration specifically with the architects it was the first official project we did collaborating with them mm -hmm. and i think that it was extremely important because like Tini said it shows you what it's really going to be like when you're in the actual field working because most of the time you're going to be working with architects you're going to be working with all kinds of people that aren't just interior designers mm -hmm. or interior architects and you're really going to have to have those collaborative conversations with them and it's really beneficial for sure. Mm -hmm. So I brought up on the screen um, the project that you worked on. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so like Denise said, we worked on the ODOT blocks, um, which is located in Portland, Oregon. And so my uh, group's specific aspects for this project was actually so like Denise said, we came in after the architects had already been working on this project for about two quarters. So our job was to really work directly with the architects and take their idea and really bring it to life. So they had a concept for the building of being a type of community center, um, something that's very natural that had a lot of 
bright, open, natural light into their space. And so we met up with them and we worked with what they had and their kind of outer shell of the building. And actually one thing that was interesting is like Denise said, a lot of the time you can't change how something is built in an architect's plans if you have not been um, brought into the project early on. That's one of the things I think is if you ever have the fortunate time to be able to work early on with the project, it's the most beneficial because you can really tell the architects, hey, this isn't actually going to be functional for the interior. Mm -hmm. But it was a really interesting project because our architects had gotten to a certain point where they couldn't really change something or they, they had it in a very specific way. So they had this sloping wall that they were deciding to keep into their design and they didn't want to change it. And so we actually had to work around it and work with the interior and actually adjust that and adjust the plans and make it a functional space for human-centered design because ultimately in interior design, it's functioned around human-centered design and designing for the people that are gonna be in the space. Even the outside of the building of the structure of the building, you have to think about what is gonna be the function of the building inside and really thinking about how people in that space are going to use it because ultimately you want a positive experience for all the people in the space. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here on the lower point where it's talks kind of, so you show the mood board, it shows, like I was mentioning, that kind of color palette of very natural colors, um, very neutral, very positive kind of uplifting. We have yellows, greens, which are very happy, positive, natural, and also very grounding colors. Mm -hmm. And for a space that is a community center, and a, and a bit of office space and all of that kind of space. It's really important to bring out all those colors. And we used biophilic design, which biophilic design is the process of design of actually using plants in a space and bringing in nature because fundamentally humans have a very large connection to nature. It's very positive connection where I'm sure many people have felt it when you're in a space with more plants, you feel better and you feel positive and there's a lot more positive human reactions to being around plants. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that went into this project. Mm -hmm. um, I actually did this project with a partner. And so we focused on many spaces. You can see in this area, this is actually the housing we designed. And so within our building of the community center, it was not just office spaces and innovative spaces, but also housing. And people were actually living in this space, living in this building, really experiencing being in this space. Um, and it was great because our architects, they, like I said, designed this to be very um, natural, natural light, a very natural building and sustainable building. And so we actually got to use what was on the outside of the building as inspiration for the inside of the building. So really within this project, we did a project, like a mini project within the project where we had to kind of look at the exterior materials and then bring in the influence of the exterior materials to the interior. So we actually kind of brought the exterior to the inside. So it wasn't just being two separates, it was being one whole and one really experience for the people in the building. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine, because I was thinking about what Denise had said earlier and then how you're saying that you bring the exterior, exterior materials or the idea of the outside into mm -hmm. the inside. Imagine if on the outside, it was like minimalist, you know, very modern uh, design. And on the inside, it was like carnival themed. It doesn't make sense. It would be a very interesting experience. It's, I mean, the thing is with that, you see that happen in a lot of buildings where you'll go into say a downtown area in San Diego and mm -hmm. the outside of the building will be very bland, but that's because the building was already there. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time in projects where you're doing something to the interior, the building of the exterior is already there. You can't do anything with that. Mm -hmm. And the people inside the building want something else. And so it's definitely interesting because there is a disconnect. So when you get the chance to design something where the exterior really can, and the interior can collaborate, it really does make a whole experience. Mm -hmm. And see, now you're touching on something that's completely different from, uh, or, or polar opposites, Let's, I, I'm not really sure what the words I'm trying to use here, but for example, so when you're working on a project 
from the inception, or at least you're going halfway through, and then you start working with the architects so that the outside of the building matches the inside of the building, right? That's that's one reality. But then like what you just said, maybe there's a pre-existing building in a huge downtown, like let's say New York City, right? New York City has been around for a really long time. So there are a lot of pre-existing bu pre buildings, but the tenants of that building leave and new ones come in and they want to completely revamp the inside of that building. They want to give it a, a facelift uh, on the inside, but that facelift on the inside will not or may not match what's on the outside. And so those are completely different experiences. One, the outside matches the inside. And so the building itself and the interior is an experience, right? You're, you're on the outside of the building and you go inside and it's just a continuation. And it's, it, it's a very mm -hmm. visceral experience. While the other example where the outside of the, of the building is not like the inside, it's a little bit more jarring. And so I think also, and you can speak to this as an interior architect and designer, um, your job is to, yes, meet the needs of the client, of the new tenants of the building. And yes, there might be a jarring experience, but it's not an unpleasant one. Mm -hmm. It's not one that like shakes people and they're like, oh, I gotta get out of here and just, you know, bolt the door, <laughs> right? So- Yeah, I mean, it could be if that's what they're going for, but definitely. I think that um, like you were saying, it doesn't, it could be a jarring experience, but it's usually a pleasant one and it's usually done for a specific reason mm -hmm. and it's still focused around the people in the building and human-centered design so mm -hmm. even if you're going from a building that's say like a brick building and then you go inside and it's like this crazy colors or something or like like you said carnival themed mm -hmm. it still provides a very specific experience and it most of the time if done successfully or done to what the intention of the building because every interior design space has an intention mm -hmm. in your home to an office building to a restaurant it all has an intention of how is this going to make the person feel mm -hmm. what is the goal what are we trying to achieve because ultimately you want to achieve that in your design you want to provide say you're making something like a restaurant and you really want to provide a romantic like setting mm -hmm. you're going to convey that in your design but say you want something that's very like natural and happy and very biophilic, which is focusing on nature, you're going to have a different experience, but it's going to be conveyed through the design. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I feel like a major theme throughout this, you know, discussion with all three programs, it's that everything is very intentional. Mm -hmm. There's a purpose to a design that vase in the corner of the room, it's not by accident, or this extra handle on this product is not by accident, et cetera. That's really cool. Um, one of the things that I uh, heard you say, I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing the video uh, or the screen, sorry. One of the things that I heard you say was that um, you were working with architects and they wanted to include a design feature that wasn't user friendly from an interior architect yes. um, perspective. How did you navigate that challenging um, dynamic? So it was one of those things, it, it was in the previous project and it was definitely the most challenging, I would say about the project is the, other than obviously having to communicate with the architects because that's in itself going to be an experience and you're going to have to be able to communicate and be able to effectively share ideas but also be able to understand that they're not necessarily going to take what you say mm -hmm. or, and all of that, like that, it's just kind of how it is. It might not work that way. And that's how it happened in uh, my group with the architects that we were working with. They, like I mentioned, they put a slope into the building. So the slope went like this, if you mm -hmm. can see. And so it took about 20 feet of space where it wasn't necessarily an effective area to be able to have people in like you couldn't stand in it because obviously it went up and so we had to actually collaborate with them and it ended up having where there was a cutout in the building and you could actually walk through almost like a courtyard yeah but we also had to still navigate around the fact that there was slope so we couldn't put desks in that space we had to you know compromise with being able to kind of move storage around and find creative storage to fill those gaps so that it was still useful 
but it wasn't going to take away from the space and just have dead space because that is a problem in a lot of buildings and even with remodels is you don't want dead space in the building because no. it's not going to be usable it's not going to be user friendly and it's really just a waste of space so yeah well all space in an area is real estate you know and real estate is money and so like you said you don't want that dead space you want to utilize every mm -hmm. single inch of property um, mm -hmm. for the user, for, for the tenant or whatever. Yeah, that's really important. Another yeah. thing that they had to do, if I can just jump in, sure. um, which is, is um, always this kind of subtlety that's going on um, in the backdrop, like you have the, the project program. And mm -hmm. there's also this kind of, uh, it's, I, I've always referred to it as like spatial sequencing. Um, you have issues of view you have issues of uh, public space, private space, uh, transitional spaces. Uh, Sequoia mentioned, um, you know, places where pedestrian travel, if you will, mm -hmm. and trying to fit all of those things into the architecture and make it work without having or being able to minimize those those spaces that you know. Sometimes we just end up with orphan spaces in in buildings, and that can be a real challenge for the interiors people because. You know, they, they know that they have to fulfill a program, but the space that they need for that might not be in the location where it should be, if you will. So that, that does become a, a huge challenge, but, but it's a good challenge because it's you know, in practice, the students will be doing that. You know, you are challenged. There's no perfect space in the world. And most every project that you'll do has some restrictions. And so it's like doing a puzzle. I think that personally, that's what I love about doing interiors is that it's this fabulous puzzle. You know, how can you make the best possible user experience, you know, with what you have? you know, with the window being there, the door being there, you know, the view being there. Right, and the flow of traffic. How do you get from point A to point B? Absolutely. And the way that's natural and you don't have, you know, like five doors in between or huge obstacles, mm -hmm. et cetera. And mm -hmm. now with, you know, living in post-COVID, you know, era, you're, you're looking at traffic, right? Traffic directions. Exactly. How are yeah. people mobilizing in an area in a safe yep. way? Absolutely. Oof, we got a lot of challenges for interiors going on. Guys. <laughs> it's definitely yeah, so. <laughs> it's definitely a challenge. And I think that again, that's why this studio is so important because it was a challenging thing that we had to tackle, but we tackled it. And we tackled it successfully where we learned something from it and we now can apply that knowledge to the oncoming projects and continue to learn from it and grow from it. Mm -hmm. And also, it just gives us experience for so many things that we could potentially happen in the field where we might run into something where there's dead space and we have to figure out what to do with it. But mm -hmm. we've had experience and we know how to tackle it. We know where to go to it and where to really figure out because like what actually the product design people are saying, research and background is so important mm -hmm. in any designing, doing research, sketching, even just doing mood boards and figuring out what you're really going to be doing with the project is so important and a lot of people like some of them were mentioning do oversweep that and don't necessarily look at it as much as you should but it is still a very important part to design and you might not have a lot of time in some projects to spend a lot of time researching but even just being able to know how to research in short periods of time and be, know how to research is so important and so valuable in really growing and learning and being able to interior design. Absolutely. Ladies, thank you so much for the insight into the world of interior architecture and design. Holy smokes. All the detail that goes into design, man, it is, it is not something to, to, uh, to laugh at because um, again, we, you only notice when there's a problem when there's a problem, yes. when you're walking yeah. around a space or you're using a product or looking at a design and you, and you have no qualms, you have no comments, no feedback, it's a good design. Mm -hmm. But when you're using something or walking through a space and you're like, oh, dang, this is not working for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm feeling a kind of way, you know, <laughs> and that's how you know the design. That. You have to think mm -hmm. through those potential problems when you're, when you're designing. Right. Because you're just working on paper or a digital, you know, some sort of a digital format. It's not you know, when it gets popped up into a three-dimensional full-scale space, you know, you have to think volumetrically, you know, 
what what are the potential problems yeah that's absolutely. definitely Perfect. and it's funny actually when you think about once you have started even as a student whether you're a professional or a student it's really interesting to see once you've really entered the world of design it opens your eyes around the things that could potentially be fixed or could potentially be improved it's so you kind of walk around and you're like hey mm -hmm. and you just kind of you always you like it's a positive thing you always have these like positive kind of ideas or like things that you find that you're like wow this could have helped me in a project and it's just mm -hmm. something you saw like going to a restaurant or you're on a, the street somewhere and you're just walking around there's design inspiration and lessons everywhere that can help you. Exactly. That's why I said earlier, new school's job is to ruin you so that when you're walking around, you're not at peace. You're thinking, how can I change this? How can I better this? So guys, if you get any takeaway, that's, that's new school's job. So anyways, ladies, thank you so much. We really appreciate it for your time and for your feedback. So thank you very much. All right, so our attendees, um, this is actually the end of the presentation itself, at least for the participants who, who were able to present. Thank you, everybody, for uh, staying on. But we're not totally and completely done. I also want to tell you more about um, New School itself and kind of like the next steps for us or for you specifically. So for example, um, if you have any questions on how to apply to the university, if you have any questions on, hey, you know what, what's the next step? Um, I like what was shared. I like um, what the students uh, had to say about their programs or I want to learn more. I want to have a one-on-one -on -one Q and A or I want to look at their portfolios. Please go ahead and email us at enrollment at newschoolarch.edu. Get connected with us. We would love to talk with you and see your questions. The chat is still open. So if you have any questions that maybe I can answer or if the students and professors have already logged off, I can always email them those questions but you're asking yourself, okay, so what's next? Here's what's next. Um, e email us at enrollment at uh, newschoolarch.edu. Get connected with us. Um, you can also start sending us your documents through that email. And so for example, start applying, go to newschoolarch.edu, uh, that's our website, and um, start applying. And the things that you need to apply are a, a statement of purpose, and basically it's one or two pages telling us who you are and why you wanna come to new school, okay? You need to send us all of your transcripts from all of the institutions that you've been at. If you're still a high school student, send us your current high school transcripts. If you're in community college, send us your uh, community college transcripts from all the ones that you've been a part of. Um, make sure that your GPA is more than 2.7. And if you've taken more than 12 design credits at a community college, you are going to have to submit a portfolio. And you're like, oh goodness, what does a portfolio look like? Well, reach out to us at enrollment at newschoolarch.edu. Ask us, what is a portfolio? What is it supposed to look like? And we'd be very happy to share a portfolio with you from one of our students, the ones that spoke today. So that is a way for you to get connected with us. That is a way for you to see the next steps and what new school has to offer. Also, our campus is going to be open very soon. So we, um, the employees are back on campus as of Monday of this week, and we're not quite open to giving campus tours, but it will in September. So if you're in the area, if you're close to San Diego, because we are located in San Diego, or if you're in Orange County or even LA County, um, the Palm Springs area, Riverside, wherever you're at, come and visit us on campus, take a campus tour, come see where your studio is going to be, come see the materials lab and the areas where you're going to be doing your projects, uh, meet students, ask them questions and get a feel for what it's like to be a student here at New School. Um, we're very thankful that you were able to be a part of this. Um, we're very happy that you were able to um, listen to the students and really get their, um, their experience at New School, right? Because it's not enough to, to know the, the details and the statistics of design, but also what is it like to actually design? And then specifically at this university, there are a lot of design schools out there, but this is what makes design um, at New School unique is all of the students' experience. And we just wanna let you know that applications for fall 2021 is still open. So if you are ready to apply, if you are ready to just jump into the world of design here at New School, we are accepting applications. So um, don't be shy if you have questions um, about how to apply, 
how to move forward, enrollment at newschoolarch.edu. Okay, so what do you need? You need the application and you get that by going to our website. Raul, could you please drop the university website on the chat so that students can have that? You're going to apply to the university through the website. You're gonna give us a statement of purpose and you're gonna send us your transcripts from all institutions. And then if you have anything to show us a portfolio, please send us uh, that as well. Uh, if you're a high school student, or if you've only taken GE classes at community college, you don't have to submit a portfolio. But if you're like, you know what? I'm really excited about the things that I've created and I want somebody to look at what I'm capable of doing, submit your portfolio, we'd love to see it. It's not necessary in order to apply, but if that's something that you're excited to do, then by all means, please uh, send us your portfolio. All right, um, let me check the chat really quick, see if anybody has any questions. It doesn't seem like we have any at the moment, but um, that is the website that Raul just dropped down, newschoolarch.edu forward slash admissions. Um, that is the best um, website web link to go to in order to get more information on uh, documents that you need to submit. And even you can just start clicking away at the tabs in the website and look at our programs to see what that's like. Now I'm going to stay on because we only have a few minutes left. And I want to let everybody to have their moment to ask questions. But if you don't have any questions, feel free to jump off, but make sure to visit us at newschoolarch.edu forward slash admissions. Um, check out the programs there as well to get all the nitty gritty details because today was just an introduction to the programs through the experience of the students. Uh, but if you want the nitty gritty details, go to newschoolarch.edu uh, forward slash admissions, uh, check out the website, look at the documents that you need to submit, and we are still accepting uh, applications for fall 2021. And application deadline is September 10th, so it's not like you need to apply by tomorrow. You still have some time, but we would like to work with you to get your application in as soon as possible so you can hear back from us and see, hey, you know what, I think I can start on September 27th, which is the start of the semester. So. Uh, feel free to reach out to us and apply whenever you are ready. So it is about 30 seconds before 12 o'clock and I want to kind of give the next 30 seconds back to you guys. So thank you everybody for coming to Design in Mind with the New School of Architecture and Design. Uh, if any professors are still on, thank you for your time and any students as well for your feedback, your experience. And we look forward to seeing you graduate if you haven't graduated already. So thank you, everybody. Best of luck to you. And we look forward to seeing you on campus soon. Bye.